so last year we commissioned Helicon Collaborative to do an evaluation of the first round of the National Playwright Residency Program. Helicon is a research and strategy consultancy working for a more sustainable, equitable, and creative future. Helicon partners with people and organizations across the arts and other sectors to realize the potential of artists and culture as a force for community well-being and positive social change. Currently, Helicon is exploring three primary themes, the role of artists and culture in advancing environmental sustainability and a just transition, more humane socioeconomic models to improve conditions for artists and all people, and equitable support and representation for diverse forms of cultural expression in the nonprofit sector. Today, we're lucky to have with us Alexis Fraz, who co-authored this report. Alexis is a writer, cultural anthropologist, and divergent thinker, enriching Helicon's work with perspectives drawn from acupuncture, neuroscience, psychology, design, tai chi, ecology, and economics. She has worked as a cultural strategist and consultant for 14 years. She is the director of Helicon's work on art and environmental sustainability, individual artists, cultural equity, and art and social change. Take it away, Alexis. Thank you for having me, and um, it's really been an honor to be here and to hear the work. Um, it's so inspiring and, and hard to follow in some ways. Um, so we, as Jamie said, um, we were uh, hired to really look at the original, the, the first cohort of this, um, of this program and um, reflect back. So we started this project in 2016. Um, and we're looking back and seeing what worked well, what didn't work well. I mean, as David mentioned, there's a lot of material out there. Um, and so um, what we were trying to do was synthesize that material and make some sense of it um, and try to, out of the in very individualistic uh, experiences that all the theaters and the playwrights had had, try to um, synthesize what were some common th themes. So um, I'll share those with you, and you may or may not have common themes. The program keeps evolving, as Mellon is and, and HowlRound are both so good at sort of responding in real time. So some of the things that may have been challenges previously are no longer challenges, um, and everyone's working things out in their own way as well. So, um, so but I wanted to take it back to start um, with just the impetus for this, which you all probably know very well. Um, but in, you know, in 2009, this book was published, Outrageous Fortune, um, and the quote is long and I won't read it, but essentially um, the idea was the economics of playwrights is, is challenging, um, people are struggling to make a living, um, and the economics of nonprofit theater sort of with declining audiences and funding are leading to theaters making safer bets, um, continuing to put pressure on theaters to pay less um, or as little as they can, um, and further co commercializing the work. And so there was a, the book pointed out, um, Todd London's book pointed out that um, this was sort of leading to a vicious cycle where there were worsening, more transactional relationships between playwrights and theaters. Um, and declining community relevance and artistic risk-taking of theaters, and it was sort of compounding. Um, so that's made me laugh when I was looking for pictures about vicious cycles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there we go. Okay, so, so Mellon, um, as one of the few, really the few foundations that thinks in an ecosystemic way about the field as a whole, um, there really are not that many arts funders that think that way, um, asked what could we do um, if we were going to design something that would create the conditions for a theater field that would be artistically vital, vital relevant to communities, and econom economically more sustainable for theater makers. And so in 2012, um, announced this program um, to see if embedding playwrights in theaters was, was an answer to that. Um, not the answer, but an answer. Um, and whether that could be sort of the acupuncture needle that could shift the field in the direction of greater health. So um, we undertook this pro process in 2016 at the second the beginning of the second term of the program, so I attended this cohorts meeting um, in that year, um, and we're really looking at imp impacts on three levels, on the playwrights themselves, 
on theaters and on the state of the field overall, which was the big question that David mentioned earlier. It's sort of this, your delegates to this larger question about um, can we shift the economic and power relationships in the field overall. So our methodology was we did interviews with everyone um, from that cohort in the program, both the artistic directors and the playwrights. We had a lot of conversations with HowlRound staff, um, really trying to understand the nitty gritty of, of their component of the program as support. Um, conversations with Mellon, um, and review of a lot of documents. So that includes a lot of what was on HowlRound's site, um, documentation provided by you all, um, but also um, any background material and things like that to understand the evolution of the program. So our, our core findings um, were that the residencies really have had a substantial positive impacts on those who've participated. So unsurprisingly, um, it really makes a difference to playwrights to have a consistent income um, and some security. The theaters were all changed, um, even, even groups that didn't have superlative experiences, um, there was a positive impact. Um, this is a really unusual, as I said, and bold and well-executed response to field challenges by a funder, um, something that conceives of the whole um, in the way that it does and, and commits over a period of the number of years that, that this has been going on um, is a really excellent um, intervention. But unfortunately, um, it hasn't succeeded in changing the economic conditions for playwrights in the field overall. Um, and, you know, in some ways that's really not surprising. Um, the, the conditions that, that the field is facing are conditions that our society is facing, right? So, you know, whether it's pressures of expensive cities or um, the gig economy, things, th these larger trends, um, it, it's sort of unrealistic to expect that a single funding program could radically shift that over the course of this amount of time. Um, but there have been some inklings that there, there could be, um, there could be some pushing against some of those. Um, so we'll talk about those. So when it works, why does it work? So what we found was that um, you know, embedding art playwrights in theaters as artists is not something that most theaters have experience with. And it's not something that most playwrights have had experience with. This is sort of a new role for playwrights in a theater. Um, so doing it successfully really takes a lot of communication, flexibility, um, and effort, um, and, and the ability, the time to be able to put that in. So there really wasn't one size fits all recipe for what worked, um, but we did find some common characteristics. So um, having a previous relationship was really key. Um, a lot of the, the playwrights that were most successful really had a basis um, with the theater already and they knew each other, there was some trust. Um, the, the, I wanna skip to the, actually, the aligned values and goals and expectations of the theater and the playwright um, because that was actually maybe the most important thing. Um, making sure that that was very explicit um, and in some cases having the previous relationship um, seemed to shorthand that. People could get into a relationship that felt very close um, without establishing clear goals and that became a problem. So um, really being very clear, this is the role that you're going to be playing, um, this is what's expected um, and sticking to that throughout the course of the relationship. Um, the career stage of the playwright the being in a place where you can take the time away from other commitments, where you're ready to maybe give up some of your other um, responsibilities. Um, someone in the last convening spoke about, um, one of the playwrights, how they were ready to let go of some of the adjunct teaching work that they had, and this was the opportunity, because it gave them the, the money so that they could say goodbye to that and really make a play for doing this full time. Um, the theater being committed to producing the playwright's work, um, that that was a really key thing. Um, and there were a couple of tensions where that wasn't the case um, that needed to be resolved. The theater having the capacity to engage the playwright as an artist, so very different from saying, great, we have more hands on deck <laughs> um, to do whatever we need to do, um, but really having enough space to um, play with what it's like to integrate an artist into the workings of a theater, including all the ways that that might require changing your normal operations um, 
integrating someone new into into deciding what the season is going to be. Sometimes that happened, or just you know shifting the way the staff thinks about things and works on things. Um, and you know, as I said, the communication is really key. Um, and the feedback and the flexibility. And, and when that was there, there were cases where things happened that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So um, someone in, in the previous, um, Marcus Gardley, who was at Victory Gardens Theater, um, talked about how um, in the last convening that we had that um, you know he, he decided to shift and make a play that wasn't planned. He, he had planned to do a certain play, Ferguson happened, he felt like I really need to respond to this moment in time um, and the theater was responsive to that and they were able to do that because they had this relationship, they had the trust um, and they were able to say all right let's go, let's go on this journey together um, and see if we can make it work and, and they did. But normally theater production timelines and budgets, they just don't allow for that kind of thing. So in some ways, if you look at the field as a whole to say, you know, that actually does re result in more responsive work being on stage. Um, and then finally, uh, the playwright living in the community and really wanting to engage with the community. Um, you know, part of this was really about relevance to community and trying to see if not only could we shift the economics of playwrights, but also shift the way that theaters engage with their communities. And so having a playwright who really felt that call and wanted to do that um, was really important. So sometimes it doesn't work so well. Um, so, and this is actually from 10,000 Things, so th that, that worked well. Um, we didn't include any images of, of places that didn't work well. Um, <laughs> So, but when it doesn't work well, um, when there is a lack of clear expectations. So often this happened when the role of the playwright within the theater wasn't clearly understood by the rest of the staff. Um, and, and sometimes even by the, the artistic director. So when there's confusion about who is this person that has special status, you know, why don't they have to come into meetings that I have to come into, their times are, that they show up are different, their responsibilities are different, um, which is appropriate, but when it wasn't clearly communicated, that became a problem. Um, sometimes the different rates of pay were challenging, so that could either be the playwright relative to the rest of the staff in the theater, or it could be, in some cases, the playwrights across the cohort, that there were different rates of pay and that felt um, uncomfortable in some cases. Um, so the, the theater, um, sometimes the, the, there were challenges when the theater treated the playwright as an adjunct administrator. Um, so there were a lot of theaters that were smaller. The part of the the great one of the great things about this program is the spread of sizes of theater. Um, however, some theaters were financially stressed or didn't have a lot of capacity, um, and so would call on the playwright as you know, can you pitch in? Like everyone's pitching in to do these things, and um, that was a tension because the playwright's role was really there to be an artist, and so um, that took some negotiation. Um, there were a few cases where it, just the playwright's working style or personality just didn't fit with being inside an organization. Um, you know, there was an assumption, I think, starting out the program that this would be a good thing for any playwright. And some playwrights just felt like, I don't, I don't want to be in that kind of environment. That doesn't work for me. Um, there were um, a couple instances where the theater wasn't interested or didn't in initially seem interested in producing some of the work the playwright created. That was a tension. Um, when the playwright has conflicting obligations outside of the theater. So this was a real challenge because unlike the person I mentioned before who was sort of ready to let go of a lot of other work, um, there were some playwrights that felt like this is, I don't know how long this is going to last. This could be three years. I can't stop networking. I can't stop doing other work. I'm going to need this. And so that sort of gets to the issue of is this a really, is this a, an ecosystem field changing thing um, even if it's three years or six years or nine years. Um, at the end of that time, the playwright still needs to sort of hustle, get back in the hustle game. Um, and so that was, that was something that came up. So um, I'm going to move on to 
benefits of it for playwrights and theaters, but I just wanted to ask, because Melinda and Will are in the room, is there anything from what I've just said that I missed from your perspectives about what worked or what didn't work? Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, sorry. I'm screwing up the mic situation. We'll have the panel later, so. Um, I think you. I think you covered. You covered it pretty well. The only thing I would add is that, is that, at least in my case, I can go into this in a little more detail when we talk. When sometimes financial things shifted, institute from the institution that might shift what's working and not working. Does it make any sense? Things beyond the beyond the Mellon grant. So sometimes those things were fluid, not always set. Mm -hmm. Does it make any sense? Something could be working and then there's some issue with finances and then it's like, okay, well that's not, that can't work for the future because X, Y, and Z. Right. You know? Yeah, there were a couple, and, and not just finances, there was a couple cases where, or at least one where uh, an artistic director left. Right, in, stuff in like that. Things like that that sort of throw the, the relationship, which really is a partnership between a theater and, and often artistic director and a playwright. Right. Yeah, right. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so so overall, um, as I said, even in places where there were challenges and where you know there might have been tensions, um, the there were substantial benefits for playwrights. Um, all the playwrights that we spoke with said this was a positive experience for me. Um, the the security of the income was really significant. Um, people were able to write more than they ever had been. They felt like they wrote better things. Um, some people tried new kinds of writing so that they had never tried writing something that was site specific and now they had a place to do that or they had never done devised work and now they tried that. And so there were a lot of um, things that people did that they hadn't done before. Um, people traveled for R&D. They saw other people's work, which for some was a luxury they had never had. Um, and some people just were able to take space and, and breathe and have a reliable income for life expenses. So people contributed to their IRAs. They paid their rent. <laughs> um, they did took care of health care expenses they had been putting off. So those are really significant. And in fact, in a lot of our other research on artists, um, those are things that often come up the most in terms of what, it, you know, everyone wants sort of what's the new funding program for artists that's going to change everything. And, it really often comes down to give people health care or you know pay people's rent and um, they'll make the work so that was really significant um, people expanded their networks so a lot of people talked about the isolation of being a playwright inherently as as part of the profession but that they were able to connect to other playwrights and things like this um, and to other ADs, um, artistic directors in the cohort, cohort or travel to connect to other artists and other theater leaders. So really kind of starting to feel like they were part of a bigger community. Um, and then also that the award opened doors nationally to theaters that otherwise they felt like wouldn't have necessarily been as receptive to them. Um, some people felt like they developed new skills. So people took on new roles relative to plays. So people tried their hand at directing or, or doing something else. Um, some people actually really appreciated taking on administrative roles in theaters, um, understanding what it's like to do the thing, to, to you know, work the whole system, um, put on a play, and you know, generally adding to their understanding of how complicated it actually is. A lot of playwrights said we didn't understand um, what goes into making, making it work. Um, and then many, many playwrights um, engaged with the community and some already had that experience that was already part of their work, but for some people that actually changed the way they work, um, starting to build relationships with community, um, whether it was teaching or trying to bring new community members in um, to the theater and for some playwrights, actually, that changed the way they think about making work and who they're making it for. Um, so that was significant as well. So for theaters, um, also, pretty unanimous, unanimously felt like this was a positive experience. Um, 
it changed the way they thought to have an artist in the room, which was part of the original intent of the program, um, to, have a, to have a playwright in the room. Many people who work in theaters are artists, and so that was something that also came up um, as a finding. But um, having a playwright in the room when the planning was happening for the season sometimes changed what theaters put on stage. Um, it made theaters sometimes more interested in doing new work. Um, the playwright could advocate for certain kinds of work or for, for work from certain communities. Um, and in part, the playwright cohort was very diverse, more diverse than playwrights overall, um, or theaters by far. Um, and so playwrights often brought um, networks that the theaters weren't already connected with. Um, and that actually changed the, the work on stage. So having a woman or a person of color in the room sometimes Unfortunately for theaters, this was one of the few times that they had that experience. Um, and so that actually influenced um, what they were thinking about. Um, and then some playwrights actually um, helped advance the operations of the staff or, or the internal workings of the staff. I know um, Melinda helped the Huntington staff craft a values statement um, and using her skills as a writer um, to help people articulate something that had been difficult to articulate. Um, so the, you know, coming in as an artist, this isn't being an administrator, but giving the artist lens to things that don't normally have that lens in the theater. Um, and then the, the main, probably the main thing that the theaters felt like they got from this was really new relationships with the community. Um, deeper relationships with the community they already had sometimes, but usually um, this was engaging with communities that were new to them. So whether it was younger audiences because of the work that was, was being put on stage or um, communities of color that they hadn't been able to access before. And this was both as audiences actually and as writers because several people will um, parochially um, engaged community as, art, as artists, so did playwriting classes and things like that, um, or had writers groups for, for writers of color. And so that actually changed um, the theaters, both the perception of the theater, but also the theater's engagement with those communities. Um, and often the artist was engaging, this is another important point, engaging the community as part of the artistic process, um, not just as a marketing approach. Um, not just come see my play, but actually either doing research in the community about the community um, to, to create a piece of work or um, engaging the community as art makers themselves, which is a really different relationship. Um, so many people or, or a, few, a few theaters said that um, just these activities or, or merely having this diverse person in such a prominent position in the, in the theater um, change the community's perception that the theater is our place. That's what one person said, that this is now our place. Um, and it changed the theater's perception of its ideal role in relation to the community. So thinking of itself more as a civic institution, thinking of how can we open our doors more, things like that. Um, and then finally, I'll just say for both the playwrights and the theaters, most of these positive outcomes came at the end. <laughs> so there was, a, there was definitely a period of time that it took for the relationship to gel. Um, and so, um, and figuring out how to work together, ironing out the kinks. Um, so just something for you all that maybe are just starting on this, that it does actually take some time for some of these to accrue. Um, so I've been sort of alluding to this, but um, this was really significant, the diversity, um, and I'm using that as shorthand for a lot of things, but um, the, the, maybe the most significant was that two-thirds of the playwright cohort of the, the one that we looked at um, were of color, and theaters are majority white. There's a huge um, diversity issue, as we all know, <laughs> in the theater sector um, with audiences, with the people who, who lead theaters, um, and, and it's um, so and with playwrights, um, with people whose work is commissioned. Not with playwrights existing in the world, but playwrights who, who end up being um, commissioned by theaters. So um, some theaters really worked intentionally on this with the playwright, um, and that was in a, a sort of stated goal for the pair. Um, there were other times when the playwright felt, by virtue of, um, of who they were, the pressure to be the diversity advocate. Um, and that was sometimes a little uncomfortable if 
the playwright didn't actually want that to be their role if they were looking for something else. Um, some people just felt like they just had to do it anyway because the, if they didn't do it, who would? Um, and so, so there were some there were some complications. The the playwright even even when the playwrights wanted to do that work, um, they sometimes felt like it limited their ability to do other things. Um, that the work that they they were focused on bringing into the theater, their own or others, had to be about a theme um, that related to diversity, for example. Um, and some playwrights just really didn't want to work on that. Um, that was not what they were interested in the moment. So um, this gets, again, to the larger issue of the field of how do we actually shift this imbalance um, and whose responsibility is it? Um, so there were varying levels of impact as a result of the varying levels of commitment to this issue, um, but there were some theaters who really took it very seriously um, and worked deep, really both the playwright and the theater saw this as a core part of the relationship, um, and the theater has made substantial changes going forward, um, has committed to um, diversifying the board, has committed to um, programming more diverse work, um, and, and keeping, you know, changing the staff, things like that. Um, so one thing that was um, really important that was sort of subtle but came out through many interviews was that class is as important as race. Um, there were a number of cases where um, people said this is actually the harder thing for boards to grapple with, that there was interest in attracting essentially attracting more upper middle class people of different races. Um, but there was resistance to making the changes that would be necessary to welcome people who might either jeopardize the business model because they couldn't pay um, or you know, didn't want it, weren't ready to pay, they were younger sometimes too, um, or people who might actually want to see different kinds of stories told. Um, and that that was the real tension that, that just couldn't be, it was sort of the third rail that couldn't be broached. Um, and so, you know, like the economic situation, this is a fieldwide systemic issue. This isn't going to be something that's going to be changed radically by one theater or playwright alone. Um, but it is something that's worth talking about because there is, I mean, we are more here than just a single playwright or theater. So um, it might be worth thinking about what, what a group could do together that, that one person can't do alone. Um, and then finally, there's, I just want to mention that you know, some of the impacts of this might be delayed. Um, we didn't see a radical shift in, for example, the demographics of who leads theaters in the course of this, this program so far. Um, but seeing more diverse work presented on stage may change who ends up coming into theater because of what they see on stage, or um, who ends up thinking that they can be a playwright because they see people like them making work and, and acting in work. So we don't actually know, and, and obviously we're, our project wasn't set up to measure that kind of thing, um, but there may be very long-term effects um, of, of having uh, more diverse work on stage, and it's just the right thing <laughs> to do. Um, so, you know, this was really, um, just in summary, really, um, this was really a, a model funding intervention. Um, as I said, you know, there are very few funders who think of the, the ecosystem as a whole, both um, national, multi-year, 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 um, various scales of theater and, and career stages of playwright, um, the diversity of the cohort, the flexibility of the program design um, and just the openness to feedback saying, you know, as, as Susan said, don't worry, um, this isn't a tryout, you, you know, you're going to get renewed, but we really want the feedback of what, what's going right and what's going wrong. Um, that's very unusual, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, and the willingness to, to change. I mean, there have been some changes, whether it's the comments producers, um, you know, trying something that, that they thought were, would help um, and then deciding it didn't work out and getting rid of it, allowing people to shift their plans in midstream, the playwrights and theaters. Um, and then the transparency, the, the documentation on HowlRound of, of the progress and the challenges. Um, and so, you know, this could be a model for how funders and artists and arts organizations could collaborate on experiments that are really intended to change entrenched issues in the field. Um, and that's something that we hope will be, um, will be picked up more broadly by funders. Um, who knows? But, uh, but that would be great.
Um, so then, you know, to my the point I made earlier on, which is just that, unfortunately, there hasn't been a massive shift in the conditions of the field, right? I mean, playwrights aren't, every theater isn't signing up to have their resident playwright um, that they're going to fund through their operating budget because they've seen how amazing all of you are. Um, so, um, you know, it's still hard to make a living as a playwright. There's still transactional relationships um, between playwrights and theaters. Um, there's still not enough diversity on stage and behind the scenes. Um, and theaters are really struggling still in, in a lot of cases with um, declining audiences or being perceived as relevant to their communities. So um, we still have the same challenges, but this has been, this, regardless, this is an incredibly worthwhile, worthwhile program. Um, and then just, you know, one of the things that, this is a quote from someone we interviewed, but you know, even many of the theaters who participated and had such a great experience feel like this is a luxury they can't afford. And so this goes back to what I was saying um, about this being, you know, the kind of entrenched economics. The theater's economics are also putting pressure on this situation. Um, and they just feel like they're, you know, they're stretched to the, the margins and they can't afford to do things like this. Um, and so, you know, bringing in the question of what's, what's the appropriate economic structure that can support playwrights plus what can actually support theaters um, is really important to think about those two things um, in concert. Oh, whoa, those colors got funny. Okay, um, actually, before we go here, I just want to um, just want to see if there's any questions or reactions to that, and also give Susan or HowlRound actually a chance to weigh in if you have anything to add. Sure. Hi. Thank you, uh, Alexis. That was really a great synthesis of a fantastic research report, and I think also in in, in truth and tra transparency, there was um, a certain amount of toing and froing as we were editing this report. And uh, Alexis and Holly were really open to um, augmenting their first drafts with um, input that we provided, and I really appreciated that as part of the documentation. Um, we talk a lot about at Mellon about high risk, high benefit grants, and um, I don't think I'd call this one a high risk. I would call it a grand experiment uh, because there were so many obvious benefits to be had from it. But I do want to say, and I think Alexis alluded to this, that um, the impact of an intervention such as this is not necessarily felt over the grant period. Um, and I think that it's going to take the round one playwrights leaving the theaters. Um, some of them will leave completely. Some of them will continue to have um, different kinds of relationships. I know that Peter Nocturne is always going to have a desk at Z-Space. Um, I think Pearl Klieg will always have a presence at Alliance Theatre. Um, and I hope that Melinda will stay with Huntington in some way. I know Will is moving on. Um, so that I think we need to look down the road 10 years uh, and see where we are. Um, there's an interesting analogy that the League of American Orchestras published a report last year on um, the role of fellowships in orchestras. And they've been, there have been fellowship programs for 40 years in American orchestras, um, some of which Mellon has been involved with, some haven't. Uh, and the benefit to the composers, um, sorry, the musicians, um, has been um, profound. I think nearly all of them have stayed in the field of uh, music and in orchestras. But the orchestras that participated in the fellowships have not changed measurably. And that's a new challenge that we're trying to face now. So I think it is a long-term process. It requires long-term intervention. It requires staying the course. So um, this will so is something we will continue to monitor with this particular program. Um, I don't think we quite got it right uh, because from day one, I think Katie Steger pointed this out at the last convening, that the playwrights were thinking about year four on day one of year one. And uh, Jack Ruler put it well, he said that the playwrights were actually paid freelancers, that they had that security, but it was not long term. And we haven't figured out the best way to sustain this program. Um, at Mellon, there's a great model of um, three rounds of funding and then endowing positions. But uh, a curator, a, a museum will always need a curator. And a university will always need a, a, present, a, a professor. Now, I think a theater always ought to need a playwright, but 
the relationships we tried to cultivate were between an artistic director and a playwright, and that that personal chemistry is significant for the success of this program. I firmly believe that. So if the artistic director moves on, what happens to that relationship? If the playwright gets an academic position, as, as Will has just gotten, what, what happens to that relationship? So, um, an endowment is complicated because if you're going to endow a playwright position in a theater that doesn't have an endowment because it's too small to have an endowment, it's not a working model. Um, so I don't think we've gotten that quite right. Um, but we're working on it, and I think we want to know particularly how this report is resonating with around two playwrights in the early period of your first uh, Mellon Grant. Um, and uh, the finding that it's not yet sustainable, the luxury we can't afford. You know, in funder speak, that speaks to failure. And I don't think we can put this in terms of failure in any respect of the word. You know, it will remain to be seen how these residencies have impacted the theater, what goes on, whether other funders come in onto this. Um, but I would not put it in terms of failure, even if it's a luxury we can't afford. Uh, I think it's really interesting, and hopefully we'll talk more about it as we go. Uh, there was never a stated goal of this program being a diversity program for the field in any way. Uh, the process of selection, both who were the, uh, what were the partnerships that were desired by the applicants, um, both on the writer's side and on the institutional side, and then which of those applications presented the strongest case for the learning. Uh, led to this uh, really extraordinary two cohorts now in terms of if you look at the field and you look at these cohorts, and I think that one of the unintended consequences that's also going to be measured over time is the amount of new work that has now been put into the field uh, from writers of color through institutions that weren't necessarily institutions focused on voices of color initially, and in some cases has elevated uh, institutions that have been historically dedicated to communities of color and elevating uh, that those um, organizations into this conversation as well. There's a, I think there's a, a secondary benefit over time that we didn't intend, but is um, was probably inevitable and also really overdue. <laughs> um, but that is pretty significant when you look at both the first out, the results of the first cohort and then um, what's happening right now. So. I'll just follow up on that before I turn over the mic. Uh, in round one, the um, playwrights were rec the playwrights and theaters were recommended by a peer panel, um, and that resulted in a, in a type of diversity. In round two, as you know, we did an open application process. So, uh, surely the panel that we chose to review those applications, which was itself a diverse panel aided in the elevation of um, certain applications, but um, I think there was a really source of, of pride about how diverse the pool itself was. We also took bets as we were waiting for the applications to come in about how many proposals we would get, and I was way off. I thought we would get hundreds. I think we got about 60, and that speaks to the intensity of the relationship we were looking for. It had to work on both sides, um, so more soon. Yeah, that's great. And um, I, is it is it okay if I ask people for feedback now, or are you planning to do that during? I don't want to I don't want to cannibalize the panel, um, but I'm just curious whether there is anything that this sparks for you, being newer to this program, um, about your own residency, things that you've already seen that are reflected in in this, or things that maybe this makes you want to do differently um, as a result of having seen this. And no pressure. <laughs> if there's, I mean, if there are no thoughts, that's okay. Yeah. I guess I have, uh, this question has only just occurred to me and I, it's for everyone. Um, but h how would the playwrights feel differently about the grant? So when I, uh, partnered with a Huntington, it was important to me that my salary was being paid through Mellon. It was important for me cataloging my presence in that office that I, my salary wasn't coming out of someone else's cutbacks, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, we have to, 
um, the costume sh shop, you know, famously goes on um, as summers off, you know, because there's not enough work, that kind of thing. So it was important to me in understanding my role there that my pay was coming from another organization. And I just wonder to self, but also to everyone, how would you feel differently about it if the organization was paying your salary as the playwright in residence? Um, and so I, that's something I want to think about for myself because it's never, right, in this term, it's a luxury we can't afford. Well, so if they afforded it, how would it change my relationship to my job there? Mm -hmm. I guess that's maybe something we could think about yeah. and maybe come back to. It's a really good question. And it may be different for people at different sized theaters or, you know, I mean, depending on what the economics right. are. Um, but I like that question because I think so often the in the dialogue in the field gets pit, theaters and playwrights get pitted against each other, um, and really the economics are problematic all around, right? Yeah. Does anybody want to answer that question or say something else? I just wanted to, I don't know if there'll be an opportunity to talk to the round one pre people that are now it's it's almost over <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to know what the heck are you gonna do you know I guess we all want to know the first we like what what is your mindset what is going on and also is there has there been any discussions with your host theater about a part-time position maybe full times too much but I certainly see uh, advantages of a part-time position you know because it's a less commitment for the organization but they might be able to get a lot more out of us on a part-time basis Okay, so we can ask those questions. Okay, thank you. Hey, anybody else? Um, I I just I I want to acknowledge uh, as a small theater some of the challenges, um, uh, in in asking uh, a playwright in residence who is there as an artist to, um to maybe adopt some of the more administrative uh, responsibilities. Um, and I'm, I, I just, in hearing, Susan, your comment, uh, museums will always need a curator, university will always need a professor. I love that idea. Um, I also hear Jack's idea that, that they're you know, paid freelancers. I think the tension there is, um, is that empowering playwrights as they should be to, to have an impact, uh, that impact often has administrative uh, uh, consequences. And uh, certainly in a small organization, it becomes difficult then to feel like uh, we can honor the vision of that playwright if we don't have the capacity to realize their vision. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just restating, I think, things that have already been said, but for us, that's been, we feel that. Yeah, that's a great point, yeah. Alexis, I know in the research it came up some, and it's not so much in this report. I wonder if you could uh, speak a little to the challenge of, uh, toward this end a little bit, uh, the the notion of the impact to the staff of there being a salaried artist while there's other impact mm -hmm. uh, uh, other work to be done yeah. um i think uh, i think for most of the residencies face this challenge in both directions the writer can feel the strain of that and the staff can feel the, <laughs> the strain of it uh, did, did you hear much that you can speak to uh, about how that got negotiated or how that expressed itself yeah i mean it was a tension and and partly for the reason you're saying um, and you know um, there were for just as an example you know a lot of playwrights thought oh great I have a desk I am going to be in a place with people for the first time this is fantastic and then they realized oh it's really noisy here yeah. and um, <laughs> I don't actually like to write from nine to five and so and then the theater thought oh I, we're gonna have somebody here all the time and the playwright was like well if you want me to write, I actually can't be here. So there were things like that that came up that had to be negotiated. Um, 
or, you know, I mean, the most common was when it hadn't been discussed mm -hmm. um, in advance and the, the theater made assumptions and the playwright made assumptions and those assumptions were, were mismatched. Um, but there were also tensions with other staff. You know, sometimes the artistic director and the playwright were really aligned um, and the other staff, who many of whom, as I said, are artists, you know, people who are doing this administrative work, but also think of themselves as artists. And so, you know, felt some resentment about this artist, this artist being able to be an artist on staff when they as an artist didn't feel like they could do that. Um, and so, uh, and, and you know, the pay also issue came in into um, play, the playwrights being paid at a level, you know, commiserate with senior staff um, and that causing some tension with staff who had been there for a really long time and everyone in theaters underpaid for the most part um, and, you know, felt some, some, so it was just, it's, it's a new, it was a new function. Um, you know, a lot of people have a standard for what a marketing director gets paid or something, um, but it, it wasn't a function that had a, and what they do, um, but this function didn't have a role. So I think that was partly it. Yeah. Um, I want to speak a minute about the staff resentments because um, they were real. Um, our goal was originally to give, uh, primarily to give um, playwrights time and space to work. Um, and as Lexus just says, that doesn't necessarily happen at nine to five in an office. Um, but we could have just given out fellowships and let you alone for three years, six years. But it was a more ambitious plan to see what would happen in by the, the notion of embedding. And we may not have adequately defined what we meant by embedding in the first place. And I think this has been a big learning experience for Mellon. Uh, it's why we asked for a work plan from you both um, in, in the second round instance. And the kinds of things that came up in the first round were the, am I allowed, do I have to be here nine to five? Um, and, uh, you know, again, salaried freelancer. The rest of the staff had a, the permanence of jobs. Uh, the playwrights did not. So I think that was a distinguishing feature, first of all. Uh, the, the, need, the need to maintain networks of work networks, um, whether it's commissions from other theaters. Um, the challenge of the TV, the Hollywood writing period, was a really tough one for us. Uh, in one instance, I think we extended a residency period, but um, it, we, we can't deny the playwright the opportunity, but if you're in residence, you're in residence. If you're in Hollywood for six months, you're not in residence. So this was really tough. Um, and uh, the, uh, the small theater, large theater, the need to chip in. Uh, where it might not necessarily be a skill set of the playwright. Um, but those were defined flexibly. Uh, chipping in was sometimes getting to know the board better, better and make, helping make the case to the board, to helping with a, um, a development role that hadn't been anticipated. Sometimes it was communication, but again, writing, writing theater, writing drama is not the same as writing press releases or social media or blogs. Um, so again, places we haven't quite gotten it right, we'd like to help continue to try to get it better, but it will never be solved because of the diversity of the cohort, the sizes of the theater, the aesthetics of the artists, and that's also kind of part of the fun. Yeah, yeah and I should say there's a flip side to that negative side, right? I mean, there were some playwrights who felt like it was so inspiring. I mean, I think, well, maybe you even said this, that, you know, being, running into people in the halls um, and those kinds of spontaneous opportunities to do something really different, um, just, it's not even a planned meeting, which you would normally have as a playwright. You're invited in for specific periods of time. Um, but just sort of being part of the flow um, and, you know, sometimes consulting on marketing for somebody's show that isn't yours um, and being able to inform it with an artistic perspective. A lot of playwrights also really enjoyed that. Um, so I think it really is more about the ability of the, the pair and the, mm -hmm. the theater as a whole to, to identify what the appropriate relationship is, depending on the desire and personality and skill sets and all of that. Yeah, I'm, I, another one that I didn't think we got quite right. Um, what about other, other artistic duties? Some of the playwrights wanted to direct. Okay, now, is that a fee that they should get separately from their salary? They were being played to be playwrights, not to be directors. Uh, if they're directing, there was an agent relationship and uh, fees to be paid to third parties. Um, we did not anticipate that one, and we had to work it out in real time. 
Um, some of the largest theaters were in positions to offer multiple commissions to the playwrights. Smaller theaters tended to think the commission, the writing, ought to be part of the salary. And then what happened if a, a playwright was taking a commission from another theater during this period? And again, very complicated relationships, but part of what we learn, we hope to, s to continue to spread out to the field. And w I think one of the things about this part of the uh, discussion here, you're hearing things that relate to the experience you're having right now. And we'll want to dig into the ways in which you're confronting these challenges, the ways in which you're um, solving them or failing to solve them. Uh, the whole notion here is that um, much of what has um, you're experiencing is already embedded in the process itself. So, so there's whatever, especially where the challenge edges are, you don't have to feel like, oh my God, we're uniquely failing. You're, hopefully you're hearing, oh yeah, these are the questions. These are, these are the issues, as well as these are the benefits. And you may, you may be finding that, oh, there's a benefit that hasn't yet been mentioned that can be shared into the room when we get into the round two conversations. Uh, but now, I, I just want to acknowledge, for a lot of you, this is like people are, you know, killing you softly with their song in a way. Like, oh shit, I didn't know I was, I didn't know it was so transparent that I was having these problems or these, these, uh, you know, discoveries going along. Yeah, people have been in this place already uh, and uh, solved it in different ways, and hopefully you also have more to add to it. And you'll hear from Nathan and Will and Melinda some of um, the ways in which uh, they approach these things. We have a couple more minutes before we break for lunch. Anybody? Yeah. No, because mine's really about first. me. This yeah. is, I mean, <laughs> this is really idiosyncratic and personal to me, but, you know, the, the idea of, you know, why not just a fellowship, you know, why not just give a bag of money to a playwright and they can go off and do whatever, or um, even thinking of it as sort of like salaried freelancers, I will just say that in my, in my personal life, um, I, you know, after living in New York City for 25 years and, you know, being with a partner who's also a lifelong freelancer, um, we, even being thrifty and saving, we weren't able to buy a place to live until this fellowship because I could show a payroll stub mm -hmm. um, to the bank. <laughs> so it's like that's and that's not um, certainly that's not trivial for me. But like I like to think that that has field wide impact ultimately for people to be able to stay in their cities um, yeah. and have and have security. That's not what you were going to say at all here. No, um, but I, I, I mean, maybe I'm going to say something like it because I feel like your, your initial question was, do we have thoughts? I feel like I have about a thousand thoughts. Um, but one of them that I keep coming to is, is sort of where Melinda started too. And it went like this for me. I was reading your report and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and getting through the first of it. And this thought just kept coming to me, which I kept trying to beat myself up for, which was, God, because I was having, from day one, I had the, the same, as an artistic director, I had the same thought that you're saying the playwrights had. I wondered about the the end day of of year three has been my obsession um and and as i was reading this along i thought the thing that just kept coming to me was god that it's such a luxury this mm -hmm. and i was judging myself for using that word and thinking of it in that way and then i saw that you reported that others felt that and i felt so much better about that but then i thought how do we solve because it isn't a luxury maybe or how do we make it how do we how do we understand that it isn't a luxury actually um which was the thing that i've been excited about at the beginning of all of this and thinking old thoughts like what if we could remake Two River Theater like The King's Men or the Comédie Française or something where you know there's there really is the need for the playwright at the center for the theater that there's that the need becomes really uh, goes in both in both ways and um, I mean that puts a different kind of pressure on on what Madeline would do and it puts a different kind of pressure on a, a lot of things but I did I have been really wondering how because I had the the same word came to my mind luxury I just thought how can we make it going forward that something that isn't a luxury at all that is a real necessity and I feel like I, I feel a bit advantaged because I feel like there are things about my theater that could make that possible, and I just want to figure out how to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I, I just to say, as we struggled a lot with what's the right question to ask, like you know, is it is it what's the role of playwrights in theaters, or what's you know to ask this group right now? Um, but I like the way you phrase that, and I would say even more like how can 
how is there a way, something I'm really curious about it, is there a way that this group and, and all the groups that have been involved in this program can somehow do something as a group that individual theaters can't do alone to make the economics of playwriting and running a theater more sustainable? Is that even, I mean, because, you know, the idea of thinking much bigger than, than a program or than a three-year time frame, I think, makes sense, but also thinking about, you know, what's the, what's, what's the larger ecosystem that we want to create? Yeah, I mean, around that, I mean, I think one of the things that's most illuminating and exciting about this is that artists are being paid the same as administrators, and that just isn't happening in our field. And um, it's, we continuously reinforce that inequity um, of artists and administrators, and with the argument that, well, if the administrators aren't doing the work, then the artists won't have a place to work. So we should compensate the administrators so they can keep doing it. But I just think this is like a major inequity in our field that isn't being addressed. And it's really wonderful that this program addresses that. And I do think we have to figure out, as John's saying, how we can systemically address this, this inequity in the way that this program is doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one thing that didn't feel to me totally articulated here that has been deeply important about my residency has um, been the uh, having a home even if you're not there and that is what's different than a bag of money and just to go playwright just write all the things in your home and I say that completely guilty of not um, not being as in residence, as certainly as I anticipated, because much like the other playwrights you mentioned, I have a perfect home office. It's where I do the things, and all the other people, and the desk is different at at, at Marin. And how do I do this? I don't know. Um, but having uh, having the home, not just the money, but having the the person to call, the literary director, and Jason to call, and going, I think I have an idea. I think I have a crazy idea, um, and having a place, uh, people to talk about it, people to bounce off. Um, uh, ideas and a cohort of actors that have been critical to, to my work that are located there, um, development workshops to jump in every month, every week, I could I could do that. Um, and so that is kind of, it's like having a, vir a virtual home, but then it's real when you need it. Right. Um, and that's something different than, it's kind of in, in between the extreme of not there and always there. Um, it's the, the um, I don't know, the, the hovering residency. <laughs> yeah. um, so that that's something that, I mean, similar to what Madeline was saying, how critical it is to have a pay stub is critical for me to have a place to go, I have a thing, let's do it right now. Yeah. Um, which has, has been one of my biggest luxury is, is that uh, per, person to call and something to, to put in place immediately. That's mm -hmm. what I've found has been the most exceedingly valuable mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, Jamie gave an inkling of some of the other themes that we're obsessed with the Helicon, but one of the things that we're really looking at a lot is um, kind of what are the economics of being an artist um, and what are the things that will actually shift that generally, not just theater. Um, and we did a report last year called Creativity Connects. It was with the NEA. Um, and basically the finding of that report, it was about, you know, sustainability for artists. And it's like, you know, it's actually, this is a quote from it. Um, our systems aren't broken for artists, they're broken for everyone. And this is another one. We continue to struggle with issues of inclusion, diversity, and equity in the nonprofit arts and cultural sector because our society continues to struggle with them. So just to say, you know, for, for sort of the question of how do we deal with artists and not being paid like administrators, gig economy workers throughout our economy right now are struggling with the same things. And so thinking, again, not to stand on a platform here, but just that, you know, what is the organizing structure to actually shift these things and who are the partners to do that? Because um, this is a much bigger issue than, than what's happening, you know, whatever's happening in the theater sector. Somebody has a <coughs> Yes. There. Yeah. Well, to be honest, we were, we were all chosen here because of our reputation, you know? I see ourselves as a brand. You know, I see myself as a brand. And, Anytime I have success outside the theater, then it's then the theater can also share with that can also um, you know receive. For example, I'm in I'm in Coco. I don't know if you know that the, the Academy Award winning Pixar movie Coco, and uh, I've gotten tremendous um, press out of it, 
but you know, but it's always, but you know, my re my residency is always mentioned in the articles, you know. So so the the theater also gains from my success, my brand. As my brand rises, I think the theater should also um, uh, you know, benefit from that. Sorry, you so, should talk. Yeah. If anybody has a burning <laughs> point or question, we can take it. But otherwise, I'll close out. And thank you for those of you who are participating online. Um, and so we're going to go to lunch uh, now. And uh, when we come back, we'll pick up the conversation kind of where we've been uh, with the round one playwrights uh, and uh, deeper reflections, uh, and especially this question of what does it look like on the other side, <laughs> which is terrifying them both, the ones in the room. Uh, all right, so break, and we're back at one. Thank you. <laughs>